History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spectacular people. Welcome to this 137th episode of the History Ghost Bump podcast. Ghost tours for the theater of the mind. I am your host, Diane. And this is Denise. And we have Denise back in the studio today. Yes, here I am. We're very excited to have you back. It's always hard to do a show by yourself because there's nobody to bounce anything off of. Well, thank you. It's good to be home. On today's episode, we have a location that was suggested to us by our listener, Kelsey Hunt, and that is Stickney House, which is up there in Illinois. It's got a very interesting history to go with it, so we're looking forward to bringing that to you guys. Before we get into that, we'd love to have you check out our website, historygoesbump.com. And Denise, if people want to send us feedback, where can they do that? They can do that at historygoesbump at gmail.com. We did get a comment on the website from KK. Hi, I just found you and started with podcast number one. You were saying how all of the houses look the same. And yes, thank you. My thoughts exactly. I keep thinking of a song from the Monkees. Pleasant Valley Sunday. One of their lines is rows of houses that are all the same and no one seems to care. They must have had a vision because that was written in their time. I do wish I can take a tour with you. There are places I live and I can tell you about. I'm still researching some other places of my personal information. If interested, let me know. P.S. I found you through Jim Harold's podcast, Campfire Stories. He's always supporting other podcasters on his show. Thank you to Jim Harold for mentioning us. We greatly appreciate that. Yes, we do. And KK, we are always happy to take our listener suggestions. Pretty much every show we do is a listener suggested show. And quite a few of them help us out with the research as well, or at least telling us their experiences there. Karen M. sent us an email. Hello, ladies. First, I want to say that I found your podcast a few months ago and went back and listened to every episode from the first one. I appreciate that you all do paranormal and history equally. I myself am a history buff and love the paranormal. So you all are right up my alley. Keep doing what you do. Also, sort of a quote unquote spooky occurrence. Nothing paranormal happened. But when I was a fifth grader in Texas around 1986, I was in a gifted and talented program. My teacher thought it would be a good field trip to take the class to the local funeral home. Interesting field trip and learn all about embalming and see the equipment. I'm sure that Josh's heart is going pitter-patter right now. I know he was probably like, I wish I'd gone to that fifth grade class. They got to check out coffins, and needless to say, that was one trip that stuck with me. And now as an adult, I wonder how in the heck did she get that approved? So spooky, but not really. Hope that experience at least made you chuckle. Well, you know, Denise, I wrote her back and let her know that when I was in high school, we used to take field trips for my art class to draw in different locations like museums and such. And we went to a cemetery for one of those drawing field trips. And I remember we were in the funeral home part of the cemetery and there was a door that was kind of cracked open and there was a person who was in there for a viewing. And it was the only time I've ever seen a dead body in person like that before. Oh, really? So it sat with me as well. So apparently they do let you do field trips, at least back then they did. I don't know if they do that now because that would have that would have been back in the 80s as well. Yeah, now now it would probably damage a psyche or something. (laughs) And Brittany C. sent us an email. Hi, ladies. My name is Brittany, and I'm a huge fan of your podcast. I listen to y'all all day while I'm at work, and y'all keep me entertained, especially since I'm alone for the majority of the day. So when you hear something behind you, Brittany, look out. I've recently listened to your podcast about the Skirvin Hotel in Oklahoma City. Being born and raised in Oklahoma, I find it interesting to continue to learn about the historical sites. I often go downtown, and I've never noticed it. I plan on staying there to see what all the hype is about. And then she also gave us a suggestion for a moment in oddity that we will be doing soon. So thank you, Brittany, for that. And as we like to say to people, if you go to visit these locations, please take pictures and and put them up over at the Spooktacular crew and stuff. We've had a lot of pictures going up. We had Alcatraz the other day. Yeah, Alcatraz was super cool with all the different cells and everything. And Jenny went out to a cemetery down there in Australia somewhere, too. And that that was really, really interesting, too, just seeing a lot of the different ways that they handled, like, broken gravestones and stuff. Also, guys, don't forget, we have our virtual meetup for our executive producers coming up on Sunday, July 24th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. If you want to be a part of that, 
You just need to be donating a dollar a month to us and you are on the list. Also, if you are a writer, we are looking for your flash fiction. The contest ends next month, August 27th. Just needs to be a thousand words. Scary story. And so far we've had three sent in to us. So we need to get more of you guys to do that. So it's a little bit more competitive, but we've really enjoyed the stories we've gotten so far. So if you are a writer, please do so. And even if you're not a writer, give it a whirl. Okay. And just for everybody, please remember both those dates are 2016. Yes. Thank you, Denise, for that. You're welcome. We want to welcome to the Spectacular Crew, Natasha. Hey, Natasha. Or it could be Natasha. Or Natasha. Either way, welcome. Aaron. Hey, Aaron. With an E. With an E. And Karen. Hey, Karen. And the best name on the list, Pandora. Hey, Pandora. Love your jewelry. (laughs) (laughs) All right, Denise, are you ready to go to Stickney House? Absolutely. Let's do it. Okay. History Goes Bump is entirely listener supported. Become an executive producer for as little as $1 a month. Get listed on the website and invited to exclusive virtual meetups. For $5 a month, you get that and exclusive bonus content like the Haunted True Crime bonus cast. For $10 and above a month, you'll get all that plus awesome History Goes Bump gear. Check out patreon.com slash history goes bump or you can support us via PayPal. Click the support the show tab at historygoesbump.com for more information. History is full of oddities, curiosities, mysteries, and the truly bizarre. Welcome to this moment in oddity. Alfred Packer is one of the most famous cannibals, but he is not the only cannibal from Colorado. Charles Gardner was known as Big Phil, and people knew all about his cannibal ways because he was happy to tell the whole bar his stories for a free drink. His criminal life began in 1844 when he killed a Catholic priest in Philadelphia. He escaped prison and headed west. He was a huge man who took to living with the Arapaho tribe. They called him Big Mouth because he would eat large amounts of raw meat. Big Phil was sent to Fort Laramie one winter with his patches and he took a Native American guide along with him, who was apparently not much use because the men ended up lost and soon they were out of food. Big Phil eventually showed up at the fort, but he was alone. When asked where his guide was, Big Phil pulled the shriveled black foot out of his pack. He told everyone that after starving for five days, he killed the guide and began eating him raw. Sometime later, Big Phil married a Native American woman, and they were living in a cabin. He was trapping for Kit Carson, and at the end of winter, one of Carson's men came to resupply Big Phil. He found Big Phil alone, and when he asked about his wife, Big Phil stated, matter-of-factly, that he had eaten her. Some claimed that Big Phil actually ate two wives, and apparently a Frenchman was the victim of Big Phil as well. Big Phil, the cannibal, certainly is odd. Welcome. We have been expecting you. (laughs) This Day in History. This Day in History is by April Rogers Crick. On this day, July 18th in 1976, 14-year-old Nadia Comaneci earned the first-ever perfect score, a 10, at the Montreal Olympics and went on to score it six more times and win three gold medals. Just a few months shy of her 15th birthday and standing only 4 foot 11 inches and weighing in at 88 pounds, Nadia Comaneci became the first person to ever score a perfect 10 in Olympic gymnastic history. She scored four perfect 10s in the uneven parallel bars and three perfect 10s on the balance beam and the all-around competition, as well as a team silver and a bronze for her floor exercise. The Russian coach felt that the 10 was wrong and criticized the judges. Russian gymnast Olga Korbut, the darling of the 1972 Munich Games, questioned Komenichi's perfect marks. I questioned the 10 that was given because there were two flaws in the performance, said Korbut, vying with Komenichi for popularity. Gymnastics fans were not surprised by the performance. At the 1974 European Championships, Komenichi won four gold medals and a silver. 
She also introduced the world to a new dismount on the uneven parallel bars with the International Gymnastics Federation officially named the Komenichi Come Down. It is no longer possible to compete in the Olympics at the age of 14, and following changes to the scoring system in 2008, it is no longer possible to score a perfect 10. There are very few Olympians who can say that their achievements will never be equaled, but Nadia Komenichi can with absolute certainty. to History Goes Bump. The Stickney House is one of the most unique houses in America and in the world because it was built with nearly no right angles. This was no accident and served a very specific purpose. The owners who built the home wanted to maximize the movement of spirits because they enjoyed interacting with spirits, but also wanted to prevent evil spirits from getting stuck in the corners. The same superstitions that inspired the Winchester Mansion seem to have inspired this home as well. The Stigneys were avid spiritualists. It is no wonder that this home is reported to be haunted. Join us as we explore the history and hauntings of the Stigney House. When I started researching the history, I immediately thought of the Winchester Mansion, not because you have a bunch of stairways that are going into walls or ceilings or nowhere, but just because it was built specifically with thinking about spirits in mind. While the Winchester Mansion was trying to confuse spirits, it would seem, the Stickneys were trying to make them more comfortable. And if they were evil spirits, they wanted to make sure that they were able to slip on out, didn't want them to get caught. (laughs) The Stickney House is one of the oldest brick buildings located in Bull Valley, Illinois. Bull Valley is part of McHenry County, and it is surrounded by some of the largest hills in the area. The village was known for trying to establish itself as a rural community, and has made great efforts to retain that small-town feel with nearly no government infrastructure. There's no retail business in the town and no electric street lamps. The little bit of government organized in Bull Valley keeps its offices at the Stickney House. George Washington Stickney was born in New Hampshire in 1809. He moved from New York to the Bull Valley area in 1835. He married a woman named Sylvia Beckley in 1839. They built a log cabin in the Illinois wilderness at the time, and as they prospered, they were able to begin construction on a much larger home in 1849. They liked the wilderness not only for farming, but also they wanted to avoid the typical town gossip and prying eyes. The Stickneys were spiritualists, and although they lived during a time in the 1800s when that form of spirituality was becoming more popular, they wanted to have their privacy. Stickney House was built in the style of an English country home, and although today it would not necessarily be thought of as a mansion, it was at that time. This mansion was very unique for a number of reasons. And one of the first things that strikes us as being completely bizarre is that the house was two stories and the whole second floor was a huge ballroom. So it's just kind of odd being out in the wilderness that they would need this gigantic ballroom. Exactly. It's like, who are you inviting to come to balls at your house? Especially a lot of mansions back then wouldn't have a whole floor that was a ballroom. The one that I'm thinking of that would be similar to that... Is the Haunted Mansion? No. The one that this reminds me of that I can think of is the Felt Mansion, because they had that upstairs room that was basically a whole ballroom, and then you went up the stairs at the end and went up to the Widow's Peak. Oh, that's true. And the weird thing about both of these is that the ballroom is on the second floor, because usually you would think the ballroom being more on the main floor with the living quarters up above. I don't know. And the other unusual characteristic about this house is that it was built with rounded corners, except for one mistake with that. But everything was rounded in the entire house. There were no right angles except for one. You know, obviously, when we think of mansions, we have a different interpretation in the 2000s. When you're talking about a mansion, you're thinking it's going to be this huge, massive place. And a lot of these mansions that are historical are not really that big. This one is not a particularly attractive or beautiful building. I was not really impressed with it. No, it just looks like a two-story. I mean, the only unusual is that it's round rather than squared. But yeah, it just looks like a two-story home. Big rectangle, basically, that's curved around the edges. No one knows for sure what inspired the Stickneys to get involved with spiritualism, but the greatest pull was the desire to communicate with the spirits of dead loved ones, specifically their children. The couple had 10 children, but only three of them survived to adulthood. I can't even imagine. (laughs) I was just saying at the same time, I can't imagine either to only have three out of 10. That's only a third, not even a third of your children survived. No, that would be horrible. I could see why they want to try to figure out a way to talk to them. The large ballroom was not built for dancing. Large seances were held in the ballroom and the Stickneys invited people from the surrounding communities. 
It is believed that they built their house with rounded corners to facilitate the movement of spirits. The Stickneys may have believed that spirits could get trapped in a 90-degree corner. We've discussed this idea when we've talked about mirrors. Many cultures believe that rounded surfaces keep evil spirits away. The Shakers would build these round barns, and I believe George Washington had one of those, and they'd done this in the early 1800s for that reason. The Chinese built houses with curved eaves, and that would block evil spirits. So it was almost like if it's rounded, they bounce off of it. (laughs) I don't know. It's kind of interesting. It'd be interesting to find out where that idea came from, you know, like in some ancient writing or belief system, because that is kind of funny. You don't think about certain shapes attracting or detracting evil spirits. Exactly. And on Twitter, I participate on Saturday evenings. There's uh, a thing called Haunted Hour that they do on Saturday nights. It's out of the UK. So it's about 5 p.m. Eastern time and it's 10 p.m. over in the UK. And I put out there because I don't know a whole lot about spiritualism and I'd wondered about this belief of evil spirits getting caught in the corners because an article that I had read had said that this person who'd written this article had done a lot of research looking at all of these different books on spiritualism and they couldn't find anywhere where it talked about a belief that evil spirits could get caught in corners but the bone writer on Twitter said that that's why you would smudge the corners of rooms which, I mean, that kind of goes hand in hand there, is the reason why you'd be smudging the corner of a room is because you would think there was an evil spirit there. Mm, That makes sense. The other thing I was thinking of, and I don't know where this came from, but it's kind of funny because when spiders go to corners, it's very hard to kill them. Funny that you should mention spiders because Bob Sherfield, Mm -hmm. our oddities guy, when he saw the tweet, he made that comment about, oh, I thought it was spiders that were in the corners. Well, they go to corners because it's really hard to kill them there. You want them out of the corner. So maybe the evil spirits aren't trapped there. Maybe they just hide there. I don't know. I would think that it would be more protective because when you are wanting to keep watch of a room, where would be the best place to be if you're in a room? In the corner facing the door. Exactly. So it almost would make you think the evil spirit wants to be on their guard the whole time if they're in this corner. And we just rewrote spiritualism according to Denise and Diane. <laughs> there you go. We're starting our own cult. Look out, everybody. Woohoo. We already know you're addicted. So now we just got to bring you into the cult. And whew. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. <laughs> no spooky Kool-Aid. Many of the theories that paranormal investigators and ghost television shows espouse about ghosts come out of spiritualist beliefs. One of those is the idea that negative entities can be the spirits of people who were mean and nasty during their lifetimes and not just evil spirits. This is part of the idea that we carry our personality with us into the afterlife. (laughs) Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Denise is going to be a very happy ghost. Yay! Like Casper, the friendly ghost. The core of spiritualism is the belief that we can communicate with the dead, and that is the essence of paranormal investigation. Sylvia Stickney was believed to be a very accomplished medium. Of course, the term accomplished is relative. Mediumship has its roots in ancient times, but it became popular during the 19th century, and as Houdini helped to prove, much of the spirit communication going on was fraud. There is no information about the type of techniques used by the Stickneys, but they could have included table tipping, channeling, levitation, and using talking boards. Or as Denise would say, tempting the spirits. Yes, the Stickneys were tempting the spirits to the nth degree. The Stickney House served other purposes in its time. During the Civil War, the Union used the house as a headquarters. It also had the first piano to be found in McHenry County. George died in 1897. We read several websites that claimed that Sylvia had outlived George, but we also found a site that claimed George was widowed and remarried. So this is, you know, Denise, when I have those moments where I start pulling my hair out because I'm like, okay, which is it? Did he die before Sylvia or did she die before him? So no fear, those who listen to us, Diane chewed that thing like a puppy chewing a rawhide bone and she found the answer. And let me just say, bless you, Ancestry.com, because they've got a lot of forms over there. There's two places that I think are the best places to go to get the correct information. And it's not always necessarily going to be the most honest answer. We've talked about this when it comes to censuses. Mm -hmm. But basically, your census is going to be one of the most accurate records. The other one is headstones. So I went to both of those locations. Find a Grave is just as fabulous as Ancestry. And I found out that indeed George outlived Sylvia. The 1880 census makes it clear that George was a widower at that time. Sylvia's grave marker records her death in 1879. So based on both of those things, you know for sure that she died before he did. 
And he also remarried. I didn't find a marriage certificate, but I did see that he also had marked as his other wife when it comes to burials, a woman named Lavina Congdon. So that would have been his second wife. We're not sure what happened to the house directly after George's death when he died in 1897. We do know, and it was really hard to find records on the house itself, we know it was abandoned for certain time periods. The things that we do know is that there was a gentleman named Roderick Smith who moved into the house in the 1970s, and he was the first to report that there was some haunting or strange stuff going on in the house. Another couple bought the house in hopes of restoring it, but their money came to an end and the restoration did not happen. In 1985, the house became the property of the local government and now houses some government offices and the Bull Valley Police Department. It has been registered as a historic landmark. A 1991 article in the Chicago Tribune reported that Mary Hill and Verna Hogan were heading up efforts to restore the house back to the way it was when the Stickneys lived there and that they estimated it would cost several hundreds of thousands of dollars. And Denise, you were looking at a website today. I can't remember the name of it, but it had some interior pictures and it looks like the restoration is going really well. Yes, and the website was talking a lot about, you know, just different fundraisers that they were doing to try to raise more and more funds to keep the restoration going because it's been a long, long drawn out process and very expensive. Well, and what's interesting is because Bull Valley is a town or a village that's very much into being rural and not having a big government, they didn't want to pay for this with taxes or other government money. They wanted to make sure that it was more of a donation kind of thing. So kudos to them. I think that's cool. Yeah, very much so. There are some who believe that the Stickneys were not into spiritualism because the craze was before they moved into their mansion in Bull Valley. But something seems to have been conjured in their home. Most of the corners were rounded in the mansion, as we've already said, but not all, and it was the one 90-degree angled corner that George Stickney was found slumped over with a horrified look on his face. Was it just coincidence that he died in the one corner that his beliefs would have led him to believe an evil spirit could have been trapped? Kelsey, the listener who suggested this, told us that as kids, they were told the house was built with no corners so that the devil couldn't kill George Stickney. It would seem that the spirit of George is trapped in his former home. His full-bodied apparition has been seen walking the halls. Roderick Smith, and he's the one who took possession of the house in the 1970s, claimed that he often heard strange noises in the house, and his dogs were very restless there. They never seemed comfortable. They would growl at unseen things. Smith said that he had heard that Satanists had lived in the house before him and that they tainted the house with their black magic rituals. The truth behind that was that there were hippies that had lived in the mansion during the 1960s. Of course, they were doing their drugs. They spray painted graffiti on the walls and they painted a lot of the walls in really dark colors. And I can't believe this. They built fires right on the floors of the house. So I don't know how they didn't set the place on fire. So more than likely, they were just squatters rather than devil worshippers. But Smith was convinced that they had created this heavy atmosphere that was in the house. The strangest spirit reported at the house is that of a woman in a wedding dress who is usually seen peeking around a curtain in one of the upstairs rooms. No one knows who she is, so some wonder if this is a conjured spirit from so many years ago. She was allegedly caught in a picture when a real estate agent took pictures of the property in preparation of putting it on the market. Of course, this would be our infamous Lady in White. Some doubt that there are any hauntings at this Stickney property at all. The couple who moved in after Roderick Smith reported no strange happenings, so they didn't believe that it was haunted. But now we've had the police move in, and they claim to have had several experiences. Officer Ken Hoffman witnessed several drawers opening and closing on their own. In 2007, Officer Hoffman and Police Chief Norbert Sowers both saw a woman in white walk past a front window while they were talking to each other in an office. They went outside to see who the woman was, and she had disappeared. Chief Sowers is a skeptic, but he can't deny that he has heard footsteps and pounding in the walls and seen lights turn on and off all by themselves. Several officers have quit after experiencing activity in the house as well. The house certainly has a strange history if we are to believe that it was a type of spiritualist headquarters. Were spirits conjured here? Does George haunt his former home? Is he trapped along with other spirits? Is the Stickney house haunted? That is for you to decide. Well, I don't know that we'll ever be in the wilderness of Illinois, but if any of you are, we would certainly love to hear your experiences on the house or pictures that you've taken. 
It doesn't seem to be a place that they allow any kinds of tours or paranormal investigation. So we may never get to the bottom of it all. But when you do have police officers claiming stuff, I lean a little bit more into believing them because they have a lot more to lose by making up stories or by even putting this out there. Yeah, because I mean, they got a lot to lose just by telling the truth, (laughs) especially in a small town. Denise, the month of July also happens to be the 100th anniversary of the beginning of the Battle of the Sum. And that is what our next episode is going to be about. The Battle of the Sum. Yes. And this was suggested to us by Bob Sherfield. This battle is basically what I would compare to our Gettysburg or Antietam. So oh, we're talking wow. about that level of casualties, which in turn brings about that level of haunting. We're looking forward to bringing that to you guys on the next episode. You know, Diane, I was just thinking, I forgot to mention something earlier when we were talking about our virtual meetup. What's that? Well, we are going to be unveiling a new program for our spectacular people who are interested in doing things like meetups with us. So we're going to show everything live on that meetup coming up this Sunday. Very excited to share that with everybody. We do have a few reviews to share with you. The first five star we have from iThor13, awesome podcast. I've been listening ever since Jessica Chobot recommended it on her podcast, Bizarre States. Great podcast, ladies. Well, thank you, Ithor. We appreciate that. And as always, we appreciate Jessica suggesting us on the show. And then we have Miss Tex 89, five stars. Great. I love the mix of history and paranormal like everybody else. And this is one of the few I actually subscribe to. I think this would be great as a TV show. I Google pictures every time I listen to a podcast and keep thinking this show would fit in on the History Channel or a collaboration of this show and Ghost Hunters that don't scream and point the cameras at their faces instead of the area around them and treat the ghosts as real people that can hear them instead of things that only hear what you say when you address them. Getting the ideas from listeners makes the show unique and ensures you hear about the best places. I hope it continues to grow. I love her ideas except for the part about us having a show I could just see me out there tempting spirits I'd be freaking out (laughs) well we greatly appreciate that Miss Tex and then five stars from ZM Timmerman one of my favorites an excellent podcast it's one of my favorite ways to get a dose of history and ghost stories in my day Diane and Denise are awesome and I love the banter between the two of them well thank you so much ZM we appreciate that we also appreciate all of you guys tuning into this episode I've been your host, Diane. And this has been Denise. You take care now. Bye-bye. This episode has been brought to you by our executive producers. We'd like to welcome new executive producers, Tammy McCarroll Burroughs, Melody Davis, and Maxwell Parker. Thank you. Fan of the show? Subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast catcher. We would greatly appreciate your review at iTunes as well to help the show grow. Thank you. Society's Rise. And societies fall. When the time comes, one society steps forward to build a better future. The Wicked Library, Kettle Whistle Radio, Night Story Podcast, Prog Watch, Red Horse Radio, The Lift, History Goes Bump. Listen. The M Writing Podcast. Society 13. Rebuilding society. One podcast at a time. <laughs>